Good morning, everyone. This is Jordan Gray from the Turtle Survival Alliance. I want to thank you all for joining me this morning for Turtles 101, a question and answer format. Now, first off, I want to say uh, that at the TSA, we are thinking of everyone out there um, who is dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, many people are furloughed from work. Uh, some have lost their jobs. Others are struggling with the medical, social, uh, psychological, uh, and of course, economic impacts from this. So uh, from the Turtle Survival Alliance, we just want to say that we're thinking of you uh, during this uh, difficult time. Um, all right, so we are gonna be talking about uh, turtles. Uh, now, this morning's broadcast is going to be some turtle basics. That's why it's called 101. Uh, we're going to start with some of the origins of turtles and move on to some of the basics. Um, we're going to follow this webinar with a Turtles 201. That's where we're going to get into some more details. But that doesn't mean that today you can't ask any question that you would like. Uh, I'm happy to answer them. And let's talk about turtles. Uh, turtles are an incredible, incredible animal. Um, we know that the earth is billions of years old. Uh, we know that turtles have been alive on this earth for millions and millions of years. And we're gonna get to that in just a couple minutes. Uh, we know that turtles have been around a lot longer than humans. Uh, they've seen so many changes on this planet, and they're an animal that deserves a lot of respect. Um, all right, fantastic. I see some people joining in with comments. Um, thank you all again. We have Boris coming in from the Netherlands, Alan coming in from North Carolina. Um, we have the Kelonian Hut coming in talking about Chicha Chitra. Uh, fantastic. Oh, others from Savannah. Well, welcome. Good morning, everyone. All right. So I'm going to flip over to my slideshow here because let's start off with what is a turtle. Okay. Basics. Taxonomic classification. Okay. So when I talk about taxonomic classification, I'm talking about basically breaking down species of animals and plants into various groups. Now, the way that we learned in school, an easy uh, way to remember the order is King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Uh, so kingdom, uh, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now, it is actually a little bit trickier than that because there's things like superorders and suborders, um, but that's the basics. So let's start off first with where the turtle belongs. First off, we know that turtles are animals, so they belong in the kingdom of Animalia. Uh, next, we know that turtles have a uh, central nervous cord, a, a spinal cord. Okay, so they are in the phylum of chordata. Now, chordates, um, during some part of their lifetime, they express um, a, one of the characteristics of uh, this group, whether it be a notochord, whether it be a, uh, a spinal cord, uh, pharyngeal gill slits. Now, those, you know, something like pharyngeal gill slits, we're not going to get in today. But if you'd like to learn more about it, that's something that you should definitely look up. It's pretty cool. Look at all these people joining in. Uh, so awesome. Pelf, hello. It's 11 p.m. there uh, in Malaysia. So thank you very much for staying up and joining me. Uh, next, turtles are reptiles. So they belong in that same uh, class of animals with snakes and lizards and uh, crocodiles, so crocodilians. Um, and then this one that's completely separate called the Tuatara, and that is from New Zealand. Uh, looks like a lizard, but it is in a order all of its own. Um, next, we go down to the super order. So that's where we kind of deviate from that whole King Philip came over for good spaghetti. 
I don't know about you, but I, I'm kind of hungry for spaghetti now. Um, but so they are in a super order, order called Kelonia. Uh, that's a word also that I want to teach you all right now. Um, it's a word that is often mispronounced. Um, many uh, throughout the world say Chelonia or Chelonians when you refer to turtles, tortoises, sea turtles, and terrapins. Uh, but the pr um, correct pronunciation of this word is Kilonian. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, I was chatting with one of my friends from Greece a few years ago and talking about the origins of these words. And he actually told me that in the language where uh, this derives from, uh, they don't actually have that hard k sound uh, in that it would be more like Kilonian. Now, I highly doubt we're going to get the whole world to say Hilonian, but just so you know, the proper pronunciation for this term is Hilonian, as we say in modern times. All right. So again, look at all these people joining. I'm so happy to see you all. Um, next, they're in all these animals, the turtles, the tortoises, the terrapins, the sea turtles. They're in this order called Testudines. So that is the collective group of all of these. They are testudines. Uh, now, testudines are actually the most endangered group of vertebrates on Earth when it comes to uh, the taxonomic level of the order. Uh, that is uh, one of the things we're going to get to in one of our uh, following webinars is threats to turtles, their endangerment status, um, and what we can do to protect them. All right, so moving on. Uh, what is a turtle? Taxonomy continued. So this is important to know because there are two main groups that diverged millions and millions of years ago. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, and that is in the taxonomic rank of the suborder. So we have cryptodirons and we have pleurodirons. Now, as you can see on the screen, just to make it really simple, cryptodiron means hidden neck. So think about m many of the turtles you know, like a box turtle, a red-eared slider, a red-footed tortoise, a sulcata tortoise. Those are all cryptodirons, and that is because they are able to retract their head into the shell. Now, there are some turtles uh, out there who have such large heads, or like the sea turtles, who are technically cryptodirons, but they have lost the ability to fully retract that head into the shell cavity. Speaking of the shell, we're going to get to that in a few minutes because it's pretty interesting. Um, all right. So next we have the pleurodirons. So when you think of snake neck turtles or side neck turtles, that is in the suborder of pleurodiron. Um, there's a lot of amazing species of survival alliance is uh, the Rhodey Island snake neck turtle. Uh, this comes from the island of Rhode in Indonesia. It is now extinct in the wild, but there is currently a plan in place to reintroduce this species to the island using stock from various captive management programs. So really exciting, and that's going to be in the years to come. Um, another pleurodiron that we work with is down in South America. Um, and that turtle, we actually recently were able to create a whole preserve in Colombia with our partners Rainforest Trust and Wildlife Conservation Society uh, to preserve it. Um, if, if you want to learn more, that's the Dolls Toad-Headed Turtle, and you can find it on our website and the story to save this amazing animal. Uh, question, okay, so how about the Matamatas? Yeah, Matamatas, what an incredible turtle. Uh, this is also a turtle uh, that moves its neck to the side. Uh, it is part of the Pleurodirons, um, and they are uh, they are very cryptic looking. They look like uh, leaf camouflage uh, 
on the uh, uh, river floor or uh, submerged forest floor. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. That's really cool. Um, so um, next one is the family. So there are 14 extant families of turtles and tortoises. All right, so wait a minute, what does extant mean? So in uh, scientific terms, extant means living. It's just that simple. There are 14 living families of turtles. Now going on after that is the genus. So when we think of a red-eared slider, for instance, they are in the genus Trachemis. Uh, if you think of uh, the radiated tortoise in Madagascar, uh, that is another cryptodiron, and that is in the genus Astrochelys. So where did they get that name? Uh, well, the 94 genre, uh, and genre is plural for genus, uh, the 94 genre uh, uh, get a different scientific uh, name. And we call that their Latin name, their Latin name or scientific name, whichever one you prefer. Uh, so that goes on to the next thing. So turtles, tortoises, sea turtles, terrapins all around the world, each one has a common name and then they have their Latin or scientific name. So the common name is something that uh, can be colloquial or relative to that region. Um, most turtles and tortoises, however, have a, a common name that is accepted in the scientific world. Uh, for instance, but there are deviations. For instance, uh, the eastern box turtle, one of my favorites, a favorite of many out there, um, uh, is called uh, is also called the woodland box turtle. That's another common name. Um, let me think. Then there's all, like I said, there's colloquial or, or, or names that are given in the region. Uh, the North American wood turtle, another one of my favorites. Uh, in some areas, they are called old red legs. That's their common name, their nickname. Uh, but for that species, their scientific or binomial name uh, is called Glyptemis in sculpta. So then how do they get these names? How do they get these scientific names? Okay, so when a turtle is discovered for the first time, um, they are classified into a genus, uh, plural, a genre. Now, how do they do this? Well, this goes based on um, DNA. It goes on morphology. Um, and they're able to put this turtle into a group of other turtles. But what's interesting, and just to show you that we're always learning new things about turtles, especially as our abilities to analyze DNA at the molecular level get better, is that some turtles who are in certain genre have now been moved to others, or that genre has been named, renamed completely. For instance, um, the bog turtle, uh, now Glypte Glyptemis muhlenbergii, uh, the wood turtle, uh, again, as I said, Glyptemis uh, and Sculpta, uh, the western pond turtle, Actinemis marmorata, and the spotted turtle, Glemis, Clemis gutata, were once all part of the Clemis genus, but further DNA uh, analysis has now moved those turtles into genre of their own. So then what about the specific name, the second part of that Latin binomial name? All right, so, uh, so when a turtle again is discovered, sometimes uh, that Latin name is based on what they look like. For instance, uh, there's a turtle that comes from Southeast Asia and it's called the yellow margined box turtle. That is it, one of its common names. It's also known commonly as the Chinese box turtle. Well, based on the yellow margin around the shell, and we're gonna again get to that when we talk about shell morphology, it, the Latin name for that is Cuora flavo marginata. So flavo meaning yellow and marginata meaning the margin of the turtle. So that's one way to name them. A lot of times, however, turtles are named after a scientist or uh, somebody else who is influential in, let's say, the conservation world. 
going back to that Rhode, Rhode Island snake neck turtle, their name is Chelodyna mccordi. And so that turtle was named after Bill McCord, who is a herpeto, uh, herpetologist and very, very well known in the turtle world. So when it was discovered in honor of him, uh, the specific epithet we call it was given McCordi. All right, so moving on. How many kinds of turtles are there? Let's start getting into the guessing game. I would love you all to take a guess, and we're going to take just a minute here to let some people give some guesses, and we'll see who is closest. Um, as you make guesses, I'm going to kind of talk through this. So I do a lot of outreach to schools and other um, types of programs. And I commonly ask this question because most people have heard of a sea turtle, a snapping turtle, a box turtle, a red-eared slider, uh, a tortoise in general. Maybe they have a sulcata tortoise at home or a red-footed tortoise. Uh, but beyond that, most people, the general populace, aren't aware of the large diversity of Kelonians around the world. All right, so we have some guesses rolling in. Uh, the Kelonian hut says 356. Excellent guess. Uh, Boris, say, uh, Boris says of turtles and tortoises, yes. So collectively, tortoises, sea turtles, turtles, and terrapins, collectively, how many types do you think there are? Um, Diego said this was covered last week. So we did cover that last week. Um, Ashley says from her seven-year-old, a guess of 150. Esteban guesses 370. Uh, Carrie, your daughter, thinks about 500. These are all amazing guesses. Uh, Pelf says 375 now. Um, Amanda guesses 1,200, Boris 400 plus. Hey, these are all amazing guesses. Uh, and many of you are just about right on the money. Um, so we're gonna get, we're gonna take a couple more guesses and then I'm gonna get to what the correct answer is for living species. Uh, now again, I wanna focus on uh, the living taxa. Uh, so the species and subspecies of turtles. Um, all right, everybody have their guesses in? Everybody's pretty good? On to the next slide. So right now, there are 349 living species of turtles and tortoises. Now, for many of you who are in the scientific world, uh, that number is a little bit higher because uh, it includes modern day turtles and tortoises, which also includes ones that have gone extinct in modern times or since 1500. Now, just to let you all know, seven species and three subspecies of turtle and tortoise have gone extinct in modern times. Most of those are island dwelling forms of tortoises. Uh, and there is good reason for this. Um, let's look at the Galapagos Islands. So the Galapagos Islands have numerous species and subspecies of the giant tortoise. So when you think of the Galapagos giant tortoise, there are many different types. Well, a lot of these are very specific to the island in which they live on. What's really cool is one of the species, which is included here under living species, called the Fernandina giant tortoise, uh, was quote unquote rediscovered last year. It was a species that was presumed extinct. However, there was belief that it was still out there on the island of Fernandina. So a collaborative effort was put forth to find evidence of this species. And much to their luck, a female was found uh, on Fernandina. Uh, she has since been named Fern. What's really cool though, is that they have now found evidence of more tortoises on that island, at least one, possibly two more. So the expeditions will continue. Um, 
And uh, so now let's look at, that's the living species. But what about living taxa? So when we look at species and subspecies. So there are 468 living taxa. So for instance, the Eastern box turtle. Collectively, that means uh, the Eastern box turtle, Terrapini carolina carolina, the Florida box turtle, which uh, many now regard as its own species, uh, but uh, we'll just keep them at um, Terrapini carolina bowerii, uh, Terrapini carolina major, which has also been now proposed and accepted in some places as its own species, Terrapini major, and the three-toed box turtle, Terrapini carolina triungus. Again, because of new DNA analysis, uh, a subspecies that has been proposed under another group, the Mexican box turtles, or possibly even as its own. But what I'm trying to get to is when we add all these up all over the world, we have this incredible diversity of 468 living species of turtles, tortoises, sea turtles, and terrapins. Now, of those, and I would say maybe the most well-known, the marine turtles or the sea turtles, actually only have seven species spanning the globe. So what does that mean? That means that four, 342 of the living species are non-marine. They're terrestrial. They're semi-aquatic. They're uh, mostly aquatic. When I say mostly aquatic, I talk about uh, things like, oh, I don't know, the European pond turtle, uh, Emmys orbicularis, who uh, spends most of its time in water, but does come out to bask it comes out to lay eggs, or it might travel over land to reach new water bodies. Um, and then that also leaves us with 461 of these taxa, so again, species and subspecies that are non-marine. What I'm trying to say is that there's an incredible diversity of turtles out there that many people don't know about, and I urge you all to learn more about them. Now, how can you learn more about them? We're gonna get to that in just a few minutes. All right, moving on. This is a big question I get all the time and one that you might be eh, scratching your head about right now. Turtle, tortoise, sea turtle, terrapin. I've been throwing all these names out. Well, what is the difference? Okay, let's just get down to the very basics. It's very easy, we'll start with the sea turtle. So the sea turtles are a group of turtles that um, they adapted to a marine life. They live in oceans uh, uh, and seas um, around the world. Um, th they live uh, as far up as they'll come along the coast of uh, England. Uh, they live, they'll go way down uh, along the coast of Argentina. Uh, the only ocean that they don't really like to inhabit uh, are the Arctic and the Southern Ocean. So the, uh, the Southern Ocean is the ocean around Antarctica and the Arctic Ocean is in the north. Um, uh, really quick, I wanna answer this question that Esteban is asking. What makes the difference in a subspecies to be not considered a new species? Um, that is uh, mostly determined by genetics, and you're looking at mitochondrial uh, DNA. So uh, there is also, just so you know, when a, a subspecies is considered to be elevated to species status, typically research is done, a paper is uh, submitted, uh, and then oftentimes there is rebuttal. Um, and that might happen a couple years later, it might happen 10 years later. The thing with taxonomic classification is it is it's ever uh, changing. Um, and that is based on new techniques. Uh, that might even be based just on uh, you know, scientists who have been around a species or a subspecies long enough to say, let's look into this because something is different about this 
and maybe they deserve just a subspecies rank of a nominate or the main species, or maybe they deserve to be a species all on their own. Excellent question. All right, so the sea turtles, they evolved uh, to live in a, a marine life, a fully aquatic life, except for when females and sometimes males come out on sandy or rocky shores. Um, they evolved uh, flippers. Uh, so much like uh, your other uh, marine mammals, uh, this aids them in swimming in those waters. All right, next let's move on to just generally the turtle. So uh, turtles uh, have evolved for a life in a variety of different habitats. And just because something is a turtle does not mean it is necessarily aquatic. When you think about the box turtles, whether it be, oh, by the way, when I say box turtle, I'm talking about groups of turtles that are commonly known um, uh, species that have a hinge on their bottom shell. I'm gonna get to what the bottom shell is called in just a minute, um, but that hinge allows them to close their shell. Uh, giving them uh, very ample protection. Now, there are some other species that do have uh, a hinge or multiple hinges on their bottom shell that allows them to close. Um, some even with a hinge on the back of their top shell. Again, the top shell is something we're going to talk to about in a minute. Hey, I got to do something to keep you here. Um, but either way, those animals are not considered box turtles. So box turtles typically live in terrestrial or sub-aquatic, uh, semi-aquatic habitats. Some, uh, like the Kuora species of Southeast Asia, uh, are primarily aquatic, like the yellow or golden-headed box turtle, Kuora arocapitata. This species spends almost all of its time in uh, fast moving streams in the Dabi and Huangshan mountains of China's Anhui province. Um, all right, so uh, basically turtles have evolved for a life in terrestrial, semi-aquatic and aquatic habitats. Okay, so then what about tortoises? Well, tortoises um, are terrestrial animals. Sure, some do go into shallow water. Some even go into water and are able to move between bodies of land. How do you think that the Galapagos and the Aldabra tortoises, the world's largest tortoises, got to those islands? Well, it is uh, firmly believed uh, through fossil evidence that they floated there from the mainland millions and millions of years ago uh, using their highly domed shells uh, and then uh, evolved on those islands where living on an island with uh, very few natural predators, they were able to attain Herculean sizes. But generally tortoises have evolved for a terrestrial or land dwelling lifestyle. All right, lastly, terrapins. Okay, so this term is used all over the earth. Um, so terrapin uh, is, by scientists, we typically use terrapin to, um, uh, to separate turtles who, for the most part, or all of their life, live in brackish water environments. So that might be estuaries, tidally influenced rivers, uh, lagoons, uh, mangrove swamps, um, or uh, 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 salt marshes, tidal creeks. Um, here's one genus, okay, so group of turtles that is very interesting because uh, the common name refers to half of the animals in the genus as roofed turtles. Okay, this is the genus Batagir. Now, Batagir are from Southeast Asia. Uh, half the genus are called roof turtles commonly, and the other half are called terrapins commonly. Well, why is that? That seems a little peculiar, right? Okay, so here's the best explanation we can give for that. The three uh, species uh, that are called roofed turtles 
live uh, predominantly in riverine habitats. The populations that now occur uh, mostly live in upper reaches of riverine habitats, such as the red-crowned roof turtle of India, primarily lives in um, upper reaches of the Shambhal River, or the three-striped roof turtle also lives in the Shambhal River uh, and its tributaries. Then we look at the Burmese roof turtle. That uh, populations of that animal now live in the upper reaches of the Chin Win uh, River. Well, those turtles at one point may have uh, very well gone into tidally influenced or brackish water, uh, but for now in our present times, they're primarily restricted to uh, freshwater riverine habitats. So then what about the other species? Okay, so we have the painted terrapin, we have the southern river terrapin, and we have the northern river terrapin. All three of those um, live uh, predominantly in tidally influenced rivers, uh, brackish estuaries, and mangrove swamps. So because of those brackish water influences, they are generally referred to as terrapins. All right, but then where does the word terrapin come from? Many people around the world are familiar with the diamondback terrapin. This is personally my favorite turtle, um, and it is native to the Atlantic and Gulf coasts of the United States. And uh, th they live in a variety of different habitats. However, the one common feature of all those habitats are brackish or saline waters. So again, where does the word terrapin come from? Well, the Virginian Algonquins, a Native American tribe of the Atlantic coast of the United States, um, gave that uh, turtle the name terrapin, which uh, in their language means edible turtle. Well, now uh, that edible turtle, who is the only turtle in the world to exclusively live in brackish water habitats, uh, has kind of given rise to scientists calling other turtles terrapins. Oh boy, I'm about to get a little more tricky now, however. So turtle tortoise terrapin also depends on where you live. Okay, so here in the United States, in South Carolina, where I live, uh, those uh, terms are, are pretty uh, distinct. Uh, turtles are turtles, tortoises are tortoises, sea turtles are sea turtles, and turtles are turtles, um, or terrapins are terrapins. However, around the world, for instance, Australia, Australia has no native species of tortoise. So uh, turtles are commonly referred to as tortoises or terrapins there. Um, if you go to Europe, um, oftentimes, such as uh, in England or other islands of the United Kingdom, where there are no native tortoises, uh, a, any turtle is commonly referred to as a terrapin or tortoise. And this can be seen uh, to different extents around the world. So what do I want to say? No matter what you call it, they are all turtles. They are all of the, um, they are all testudines, they're all chelonians. And an easy way to remember this is that all tortoises, sea turtles, and terrapins are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises, sea turtles, and terrapins. Kind of tricky, I know, but hey, maybe you can remember that. Um, let's see, Pelf says, uh, Batiger affinis affinis and Batiger affinis Edward Moli. Uh, so those are, thanks uh, Pelf. Uh, by the way, Pelf uh, works in Malaysia. Uh, she does incredible work for this species, the Southern River Terrapin, one of the most endangered uh, uh, turtles in the world. And uh, uh, this is broken down into two different subspecies, uh, the uh, Western Malay River Terrapin and the Eastern Malay River Terrapin. 
Um, all right. So um, let's see. Boris says, although we sometimes refer to the differences just by adding either water, sea, or land to the word, <laughs> basically, hey, uh, people, people do what they want. So no matter what you say, if you just call something a turtle, you're being correct about it. All right, let's move on to, to the origins of turtles. Here's another question. It is time for you all to put on your thinking hats, uh, your guessing, and, and wonder how long have turtles lived on Earth? Uh, if you see in the picture there, we have a uh, turtle. Uh, I have to be honest, I inserted that turtle. It is actually a uh, three-stripe roof turtle from India. I uh, inserted that turtle into this picture of a tyrannosaur uh, seeming to give uh, uh, heck uh, to these uh, uh, other bipedal uh, dinosaurs there. Uh, not sure what species there are. So if there's any um, uh, archaeologists out there who would love to tell me the species of that, uh, of that dinosaur, please throw it out there. All right, so let's see, Esteban guesses 300 million years. Excellent guess, Esteban. Boris, uh, did you guess? Oh, I expected you to guess, Boris, where are you at? All right, the Kelonian hut guesses 220 million years. You've been doing your research, haven't you? All right, Pelf guesses 250 million years. By the way, when we're throwing these uh, ages out, that's a long time, by the way. That's not like yesterday, okay? That's not like a thousand years ago. We're talking about millions of years. I mean, that's older than my father, if you can even imagine. And personally, I can't. Um, Diego guesses 100 million. Uh, Carrie says that Haley guesses a million years. Boris, there you are, now that I called you out, uh, 225 to 65 million years ago. All right, these are all fantastic guesses. I'll take one more guess, and then we're going to get to the nitty-gritty. How long have turtles lived on Earth? Who wants to give a guess? Are you out there? Are you out there in turtle land? One more guess. Okay, pretend this is the price is right. Say one year, say one million years. Maybe you'll get the money. By the way, it's Thirsty Thursday, but you know, I'm gonna take a sip of my delicious uh, Coke Zero here. Uh, by the way, Coke, now you need to give me some money for uh, sponsoring you. Nah, I better have another guess by the time I finish my Coke Zero. One more guess. Uh, all right, there we go. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, Jace guesses two million years. Excellent guess, Jace. All right, the moment you all have been waiting for. So, turtle origins. Many of you all were very, very close. So, about 260 million years ago, uh, during the geologic time period known as the Permian uh, Epoch, um, this animal um, uh, basically arose called Eunotosaurus. Now, Eunotosaurus, if you look at the very bottom picture, that doesn't really look like a turtle to you or I. Well, guess what? At some point, we didn't really look like the humans we are now either. But Eunotosaurus, for the most part, really resembled a lizard. But in the fossil record, this is the first animal to start showing um, bone structure and cartilage structure that uh, gives rise to modern day turtles. All right, hey, Rachel uh, from Texas just guessed 300 million years. Rachel, you're late, where were you at? Uh, Heidi uh, guesses 225. I like how you all are now guessing after I've said the answer. Um, I see how it is. But you know what? I like your enthusiasm. All right. So 
Uh, the next st a major step, okay, there's always going to be steps along the way because, again, we are talking about millions and millions of years of evolution. One can't even comprehend what a million years is like, okay? I can't even remember, you know, what happened 20 years ago. I'm 37 years old. Uh, I can't even comprehend in my mind a million years, much less 260, okay? Aside from that, going to the next big step, really big step in Kelonian or turtle and tortoise evolution happened around 210 million years ago. And that's when this animal um, uh, basically evolved called Proganochelys. Now, Proganochelys was the first in the fossil record to show a fully formed shell. Um, that also meant that uh, inside the body, changes had to start happening. Uh, its pelvic girdle, uh, its uh, clavicles where the shoulders are, things had to start moving around during that time period to be able to accommodate a shell and being able to move around basically with this hulking structure around your body. All right, so then another big step happened. And if you re remember uh, earlier, I was talking about cryptodirons and pleurodirons. But if you're just joining us, uh, basically, basically cryptodirons are hidden neck turtles. That's the turtles that many of you think of, like your Galapagos tortoises, uh, your sea turtles, your box turtles, your painted turtles, your terrapins. Um, those are the cryptodirons. And then we have the pleurodirons. And the pleurodirons are your side neck and your snake neck turtles. So things like the eastern snake neck or long neck turtle from Australia, or the um, pink bellied side neck turtle from South America, or the doll's uh, toad headed turtle from, um, from Colombia. There's even a side neck turtle that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, we commonly call it the African helmeted turtle, and that is a pleurodiron that uh, is oftentimes seen in aquaria at uh, some of your large retail uh, pet stores. Um, now, does that mean I promote going out and buying one of these animals? Uh, no, that's absolutely not what I'm saying. But if you've ever gone into one of these major retailers, you may have seen a pleurodiron up close, the African helmeted turtle. Um, so then Esteban asks, how, many time, how much time has happened between the first reptile appearance on Earth and the eunotosaurs? Um, so the first reptiles um, the, uh, really started uh, uh, coming about uh, during uh, that uh, uh, excuse me, the late Carboniferous and early Permian. Um, uh, and so then uh, turtles are one of, and then there was major evolution in the reptiles during the Triassic, uh, uh, Jurassic, and Cretaceous ages. Uh, but either way, uh, the, the turtle is one of the oldest forms of reptile on Earth. Excellent question, Esteban. All right. So that, that kind of divergence between the cryptodirons and the pleurodirons uh, began happening about 157 million years ago. Now, shortly after that, <laughs> 37 million years short, uh, is when we get to the period in time in the Cretaceous uh, period when we started seeing our modern day turtles. Uh, basically, uh, the, the, the shape, the evolution of what we now know as turtles, tortoises, sea turtles, and terrapins. Now, the, our, uh, the, the oldest fossil record of our modern day turtles is that of the softshell turtles, uh, uh, the trionychids. And that is a group of turtles uh, that comes in many different forms and genre. Uh, and we're gonna get to uh, the softshell turtle versus the hard shell turtle in just a minute. So moving on, let's talk about that shell. All right, so 
generally speaking, not even generally speaking, matter of factly speaking, all turtles on Earth have a shell. Now, what that shell looks like and how it functions uh, is uh, depends on the group of turtles that they are in. So let's talk about those trionychids, the soft-shelled turtles. So soft-shelled turtles from the outside look very, very different than our turtles that many of us think about, like the sea turtles, like your sulcata tortoise that might be right now bulldozing through your fence in the backyard, a uh, native of uh, um, uh, Africa, sorry about my stuttering there, um, uh, or your box turtles. Uh, the Colonian Hut says chitra chitra, absolutely. By the way, did you notice the way that I pronounced that? So when we talk about Kilonians or pronounce the CH in most uh, turtle names, like the alligator snapping turtle, which is Macrochelys teminkii, or uh, what's another one, uh, good one? Uh, the Rhode Island snake neck turtle, Chelodyna macordi. Uh, I use a hard CH sound. However, with Chitra Chitra, uh, that uh, species actually uses that ch sound uh, much like you would say the word cheese. Um, so hey, Colonian Hut, I'm really glad you brought that up because it was another learning lesson. All right, so again, the trionychids, the soft shell turtles, have this uh, reduced hard bony shell underlying a thick layer of skin. Now, this uh, reduced shell uh, is rather light in weight, um, and that, uh, that skin covering, um, that whole structure allows them to not only be very fast in water, but they are also rather fast on land. Uh, depending, of course, on their mass, the weight of the animal. Um, but very importantly for the trionychids, it actually allows them to uh, basically uh, lay flat on the bottom of their habitat and kind of scuffle in for camouflage. Think of them like the flounder or the halibut or the uh, sole, all kinds of fishes of the turtle world. Um, Heidi says, love the softies, was so excited regarding the Indian narrow-headed hatchling yesterday. Absolutely. Thanks, Heidi. Softshell turtles, I mean, they're awesome. They're like little UFOs flying in the water, little flying pancakes or saucers. Really cool turtles. All right, so now let's get to another turtle that looks very, very different than, let's just say, most of our turtles that we're very familiar with. And that is the leatherback sea turtle. So the le leatherback sea, uh, sea turtle um, is not only the largest turtle on earth by uh, weight and by size, uh, but it is also the fastest turtle. Uh, this turtle can swim at speeds of up to 22 miles per hour. Uh, by the way, uh, I would I, I would challenge any of you watching to try to uh, go 22 uh, miles per hour, uh, to swim 22 miles per hour. Um, good luck. Um, but either way, this turtle also, uh, their shell is very different. They're covered in a very thick layer of skin, um, and they have a uh, much more uh, reduced shell. Um, but this turtle is actually, uh, besides all those things, so, I mean, this is like the world record holder of turtles. So it's the heaviest, it's the biggest. It, uh, it uh, what did I say? It's the fastest. It also dives the deepest. So leatherback sea turtles are able to go in pretty cold water environments. Uh, they have been seen off the shores of Alaska. And last I checked, Alaska and the Aleutian Islands, uh, that's pretty cold water. Well, this species of turtle can actually dive down to depths of over 4,000 feet. Uh, that is an incredible feat, something that humans can only do in a, uh, in a submarine. Uh, so again, turtles are amazing. Um, let's see, Emily says, my best was about a meter a second swimming speed. Emily, great job, not bad. 
we got a leatherback sea turtle out there somewhere who's probably willing to challenge you. So, uh, you know, I, it's time to get in the pool and, uh, you know, swim some laps again. All right. So Pelf says leatherback turtles, all the superlatives. Exactly. If this were the back of a high school yearbook, uh, then yes, every superlative would go to the leatherback sea turtle. Um, now, uh, prettiest, and it's all in the eye of the beholder. If the leatherback sea turtle is the prettiest to you uh, or the most successful, hey, that's up to you. But let's get back again to the shell of the turtle. So in the general terms, uh, the shell is uh, made of bone. When a turtle hatches from its egg, uh, and by the way, we're going to talk about uh, eggs and reproduction in our next webinar, Turtles uh, 201. Um, the, the shell is made of dermal bone. It's skin-derived bone. It's very, very flexible. Um, now, as that turtle ages and consumes food and is, uh, gets access to uh, ultraviolet light, um, that shell will then uh, begin to calcify and it will calcify then into hard calcified bone. Um, now, uh, if you look at the images on the screen, let's talk about um, the general terms for that bony shell. So uh, what you see when you look at a turtle is an animal covered in typically skin, as in the trionychids, the soft-shell turtles, or the leatherback turtle, or you see them covered in um, these scales. And these scales are made of keratin. And keratin is that same material that our fingernails, our skin, our hair um, is made of. And um, those uh, scales can be called plates, they can be called scutes, or like I just called, said, they can be called scales. Now, in modern times, uh, I found that most people use the term scute. Uh, however, um, a plate uh, or scale is very, very acceptable. Um, so then let's talk about the rest of them. Um, so starting with that very one at the top on your left-hand screen, we have what's called the precentral scute um, or the nuchal scute. Uh, that is uh, the beginning, and it is one of, if you were to look at them collectively, the marginals. So the marginals are aptly named because they go around the margin of the top shell. Oh, by the way, what is the top shell, you ask? That is called the carapace. So the carapace is the top shell of a turtle. Um, all right, so the marginals go around, but then in the very back, we have some marginal scutes that are called the postcentrals, also known as the supracaudals. Um, so uh, caudal uh, being that they are um, back towards the tail, the rear end of the animal, and supra meaning that they are above uh, the tail. So they are the supracaudals. Going uh, straight down the back of the turtle, uh, those plates are called laterals. Uh, no, excuse me. I was thinking of the wrong one. Those ones are called um, centrals or vertebrals. Again, uh, in, modern uh, in modern day, most people that I know tend to use the term vertebral, uh, but central is also uh, very, very acceptable. Uh, now going... Uh, Next to the vertebral or centrals, we have uh, the laterals, uh, which are also known as the plurals or costals. Um, now, uh, a lot of this has to do with, we're talking about the plates covering the bony shell, those outer keratinaceous plates. Um, the costal bone uh, actually lies beneath those plates in the area, but again, people commonly refer to the plates on the outside as costals. So if you wanna call them laterals, plurals, or costals, uh, that is generally accepted. Uh, let's see, uh, Emily says, super caudal fragilistic expialidocious. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Whenever I'm like marking a turtle during research now, uh, Emily, I think I'm going to say that. 
All right, so then let's go to the bottom shell. So this is called the plastron. Uh, and the plastron also is, uh, is covered in uh, most species, um, except for those uh, soft-shelled turtles by uh, the same type of keratinaceous scales. Um, so at the, at the very top, towards the head, we have the gular scutes. Um, uh, now, below those, we have the humeral scutes because they are in proximity to the humerus, uh, the funny bone, we'll call it, of the arm. Um, then below that, we have the pectoral scutes. Uh, those cover uh, what we would think of the chest of the turtle. Uh, below that, we have the abdominal. So if you think of it covering the abdomen of the turtle. Uh, and then we below that, we have the femoral scoot. Uh, that femoral scoot uh, is in proximity to the major uh, bone of the leg, the femur. Um, and then finally, we have the anal scutes. Uh, now, along the sides where the carapace and the plastron meet, we have axillary scutes, we have inguinal scutes, and we have a bridge. All right, that is just very, very general because I'm about to throw a loop into all this. Not all turtles who have uh, uh, a hard-shelled plastron, hard-shelled outer shell covered in scales have this exact what we call um, morphology, okay, the, the uh, characteristics. Uh, some turtles have more marginal scutes than others. Uh, some turtles have an extra pair of gular scutes uh, called intragular scutes. Um, other, other turtles uh, do not display the same auxiliary or inguinal scutes as some other species. Some of them even lack uh, what we might think of as the pectoral or abdominal scutes altogether and so have less count. I know this is all confusing, but hey, it's at least a way that we can learn about just generally the carapace, the plastron, and the scales, plates, or scutes that make up the outside of those structures. All right, uh, let's move on really quick to where do turtles live. All right, generally speaking, and this is awesome, turtles live all over the world. So turtles live on every single continent except for Antarctica. Um, so uh, if they ever come out with a, uh, a, a little feet, or happy feet, I think it is. Uh, little feet, little foot. That's that dinosaur movie, Land Before Time, whatever. Uh, if, if they ever come out with another happy feet and you see a turtle that they've included there, eh, most likely that's not really correct. Uh, now, does that mean that sometime in the future, as the climate changes, uh, that turtles will not inhabit uh, the Southern Ocean or uh, Antarctica? No. Oh. That's totally possible, but that may be well out of our lifetime. So again, turtles live on North America. They live on South America. They live in uh, that landmass connecting the two, uh, which we refer to as Central America. Uh, they live in Europe. They live in Asia. Uh, they live in the uh, uh, island chains and archipelagos of uh, the Coral Sea, the South China Sea, the Indian Ocean. Uh, they live on Australia. They live throughout Africa. So that huge diversity of turtles, tortoises, terrapins, and sea turtles that we talked about before um, live all over the world. Um, and they are um, evolving to an extent. Okay, so you know that red-eared slider that mo um, much of you know? The red-eared slider, I would say conservatively, is the most um, commonly known turtle in the world uh, next to sea turtles. Uh, they're definitely the most popular pet turtle in the world. And now, uh, as far as terrestrial and aquatic and semi-aquatic turtles go, they have the most extensive range. Uh, and that's because they have been introduced all over the world uh, due to the pet trade. You can now find red-eared sliders living in uh, coastal Alaska. 
You can find them in the fjords of Norway and Sweden. If you go to the remote jungles uh, of some of the islands uh, like Borneo and Sumatra uh, in Southeast Asia, you, um, you can find them deep within the jungle there. If you're on a riverboat tour going up the Amazon River, you can find red ear sliders. They are, uh, they are now abundant uh, throughout many places on earth. Uh, they, are, uh, they adapt very, very well. And uh, some may call them a nuisance. We're gonna get to that in a different webinar. All right, so one thing I do wanna ask you now that you know that turtles live around the globe is what country do you think is the most turtle rich? Meaning what country on earth has the most species and subspecies of turtles? I'm gonna give you all a couple minutes to guess. And in that time, I'm gonna break out a couple of my little shelled friends. So please tell me what country you think has the most species of turtles tortoises, sea turtles, and terrapins, collectively known as colonians. Uh, Seamus guesses the United States. Excellent guess, Seamus. Uh, Gene Hedrick guesses the United States. I see a pattern. Boris says, I will not guess since this was on last week's question as well. Boris, I thank you for playing along as a, as a uh, fair sport. Esteban guesses the USA. Alan guesses the US. Um, Esteban, Esteban, you watched last week, come on. I know you know the answer. I remember you watching. Uh, in case you all uh, missed last week's webinar, it was entitled Transforming Passion for Turtles into Effective Conservation Action. Uh, I recommend, recommend you check out that webinar. Um, Jace uh, says the United States as well. Uh, Haley thinks the US. All right, everybody who has guessed thinks the United States. Well, guess what, people? You are correct. So the United States of America has the most tight Boris Luxembourg. Come on. Um, okay, but you know what? Every guess is a good guess, but I know Boris is playing with us. All right, so yes, the United States of America has the most types of, uh, of Kelonians with 89 species and subspecies. That is followed by Mexico with 65 species and subspecies, and then India with 42 species and subspecies. All right, so going on, it's now time. We've been here for an hour. Uh, you're probably tired of listening to me drone on, but I wanna hear your turtle questions and I'd love to answer them. And while we're doing that, check out this little cutie. This is an ornate box turtle. Uh, I've named her Andromeda because she has this beautiful pattern, constellation-like pattern on her top shell, or as you learned, carapace. Um, and she, I don't know how old she is because uh, I received her um, from somebody who, who had had her for about 30 years. Um, so I know that she is at least several decades old probably more, but she is a beautiful species called the ornate box turtle, native to the central United States. All right. Emily says, I'm currently consolidating a bunch of online webinars for the aquarium I work at, so I have seen the prior turtle talk. Thank you, Emily, I appreciate it. All right, does anybody out there have any turtle questions for me? Now's the time to ask your favorite turtle 101 question. Any question is great. And again, while we're at it, I'll bring out another turtle. So this turtle here is called the diamondback terrapin. I'll get it close so y'all can see. This here is a northern diamondback terrapin. Uh, again, a species that lives along the Atlantic coast. Uh, the northern diamondback terrapin lives from Massachusetts uh, down to about uh, central North Carolina, 
where they then um, integrate with the Carolina Dimeback terrapin uh, and subsequently the species uh, becomes the Carolina Diamondback terrapin in Southern North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Northern Florida. All right, so I have some questions uh, coming in. Esteban says, you know about the Chilinoidus uh, chilensis? Oh yeah, Chilinoidus chilensis. Uh, what an amazing turtle. Um, uh, this is the uh, 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 Chaco tortoise. Uh, this species is uh, native to uh, southwestern uh, South of America. Um, it, uh, it's a beautiful uh, species. Uh, and I want to tell you all something really, really interesting. The Chaco tortoise is actually the most uh, uh, commonly related species to the Galapagos tortoises. Um, so what's uh, fascinating about that is that the Chaco tortoise is a, a fairly small tortoise, while uh, the island uh, tortoises, the Galapagos tortoises, or the giant tortoises, are extremely large. Yet how uh, uh, these tortoises are the most related uh, to each other uh, of any mainland species to uh, your Galapagos tortoises. All right, Mallory Lindsay. Hey, Mallory. Uh, just so everybody knows, so Mallory is a good friend of mine. Uh, and if you want to learn more about reptiles, about uh, amphibians, about all sorts of different kinds of animals from mammals to birds to insects. Uh, you should check out Miss Mallory Adventures. Uh, she does all sorts of uh, live videos, recorded videos, uh, uh, webinars uh, on a daily basis. Uh, she has a really cool um, uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram, and Facebook uh, channels for you all to learn pretty much as much as you want to know about all sorts of different animals. Uh, either way, Mallory asks, what is the best way to help our local turtle species? Mallory, that's a, a great question. Now, I'm going to get more in, in depth in a uh, subsequent webinar, but basically the best way you can get involved is to start local. Again, uh, you, uh, we're looking at uh, a world full of turtle species, but more than 50% of those right now are threatened with extinction, whether they be at the level of, of threatened, uh, endangered, critically endangered, um, or functionally extinct in the wild. Um, so the best way you can help is to start local because turtle conservation takes all of us. We have to build a patchwork based on our passion for these animals. So uh, find a local turtle conservation group, uh, find a nature center. I mean, nature centers, that's where I started out. Uh, Hidden Pond Nature Center up in Springfield, Virginia is where I started volunteering at a very young age to get involved uh, with reptiles. Um, but find a project near you that you can get involved with to help turtles. Now, if you want to get involved, uh, stay around for uh, another slide or two, and I'm going to give you uh, my email address uh, so that if you want, I can help you find the closest turtle project to you. Uh, great question, Mallory. Um, Emily says, could you put that link in the chat? Um, uh, Emily, which link are you referring to? Okay, Diego then asks, is there a, a, a really effective way to aid turtle conservation through captive breed, keeping and breeding, or is conservation best left to the pros? Woo, Diego, you just opened up a Pandora's box. I'm going to dive deeper into that in a, a, a future webinar. Um, there are many different thoughts and philosophies towards that. Um, what I can tell you right now is as far as the captive breeding of turtles and tortoises to reintroduce them to the wild, um, those reintroduction efforts 
uh, for the most part, happen through uh, nonprofit organizations uh, or zoological institutions or other accredited facilities. Um, uh, what it comes down to really is at the uh, the governmental level of uh, the reintroduction of that species. Um, and those decisions have to be made based on uh, uh, the uh, health uh, of the population, uh, the current wild population, if there is any. Um, so things like disease transmission, you have to take into account different things like uh, genetics. Um, are the animals you, you're re potentially releasing as close to uh, the ge genetics of uh, the animals uh, that currently inhabit the area? Uh, the best way I'll put that is, like you said, is it best left to the pros? Um, I will say for the most part, it's best left to the pros uh, because uh, that is what the governmental institutions are going to rely upon is the pros. Um, now, uh, as far as keeping and breeding turtles, uh, you know, it, I, I personally own turtles myself. If somebody wants to keep and breed turtles, uh, that is on their own accord. I'm not going to, you know, some, say one way or the other whether they should or should not do that. All I will say, however, is if one does keep and breed turtles, is to do so responsibly, to educate oneself, um, and to, you know, share your passion for these animals in the best way possible. Um, so I have lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to have to rewind a little bit. Um, Amanda asks, uh, I work at an animal rehabilitation habitat, and we recently acquired some yellow-bellied sliders. In terms of enrichment, do you have any recommendations? Um, Amanda, so uh, turtles by nature, the, especially the yellow yellow belly sliders, are opportunistic. They are uh, predominantly herbivorous in uh, their later years, but highly carnivorous in uh, as young turtles. Um, using different types of food enrichment is a really great way. Also, turtles are rather inquisitive to new objects in their environment. So whether it's adding a new log, uh, changing the way that maybe the rocks are placed in the tanks. Um, but you have to think about with, uh, with uh, turtles, um, they have, you know, they have their rhythms uh, and their rhythms are based on staying alive uh, and breeding uh, and all the things that go along with that. So uh, feeding, finding shelter, uh, maintaining the proper temperature, looking for a mate, uh, reproducing uh, should mating occur. Uh, all of these things that have been ingrained in them by these millions of years of evolution. So take their natural history and think of what different types of things you could do to enrich them. And food enrichment, especially for a, an opportunistic omnivore like a yellow-bellied slider, is a really great way to enrich them. All right, uh, Jace wants to know what a turtle's favorite food is. Uh, that's a really great, great question. And, uh, you know, that really depends on what species we're talking about. Some species are predominantly herbivorous, uh, meaning they eat plant material. Others are um, omnivorous, just like humans. So they, they eat plant and animal material. Others are predominantly carnivorous. So they predominantly rely on uh, other animal matter as uh, their source of nutrients. Excellent question, Jace. Um, let's see the next one. At what age did you start your passion for turtles? That's a really, really good question. So I would say about the age of four. I grew up in upstate New York along the Hudson River um, at a military installation known as West Point. Uh, that is where the United States Military Academy is. Um, but by growing up there, I was able to live in this relatively secure, safe environment, but one that was heavily forested. It had ponds, uh, woodlands, uh, marshes, swamps, 
uh, hillside streams. So there was all sorts of reptile and amphibian life that could be found there. And that's where my um, love for these animals really began. Uh, I think my very first turtle that I owned was a red-eared slider. Surprise, surprise. That's very common for many, many people. Uh, I followed that up with uh, a native uh, eastern painted turtle uh, that I had uh, caught from a local pond. Um, and then my love just, you know, it just snowballed from there. And here I am, 37 years old, and there's nothing that I would rather do on this earth than help turtles. All right. Um, next one, Seamus asks, besides causeways and man-made roads on the coast, where do diamondback terrapins nest? I know that root predation from cord grass is rather high. So would they nest further up freshwater rivers? Seamus, really, really good question. Now, when we're talking about diamondback terrapins and nesting, we actually really have to break it down uh, by the subspecies. Uh, for instance, uh, the Northern and Carolina diamondback terrapins, uh, as well as the Florida East Coast terrapin, uh, uh, tend to nest um, uh, fairly near the water. Um, they may do so in, um, in sand, uh, sandy soils, uh, a loose loamy soil. By the way, loamy is basically a mix between sand and um, organic material, dirt. Um, and uh, uh, root predation is oftentimes a, uh, a threat to turtle eggs. Um, if we're talking about uh, species down along the Gulf Coast, so like your Texas, your Mississippi, your ornate diamondback terrapins, um, or down in the Keys, your mangrove diamondback terrapins, then we're oftentimes looking at uh, uh, not only sandy areas, but oftentimes uh, shell hash islands. So that's where the oysters, the clams, uh, and other bivalves, um, gastropods, uh, ha um, and mollusks have basically their shells uh, have built up over time into these little islands. And that uh, very well gets mixed with uh, particles of organic or inorganic material like sand, and they'll nest in those areas. So great question. You know what, we can talk about that more if you want to drop me an email. Um, so love to talk about Dimeback Terrapins. Nothing I'd rather talk about more. Um, Boris says, I've got to go. Uh, thanks for this one as well. Last week I joined TSA USA and even bought a t-shirt at the same time. Hey, Boris, thanks so much for tuning in to uh, two separate webinars. I've really enjoyed having you on, your questions, your comments, um, and thank you so much. And Boris brings up a great point. Our TSA store is still open for business. The amazing Emily uh, is at our office and is able to still send out merchandise from our office. So please take a look at our web store on our website turtlesurvival.org um, and show your turtle pride uh, while you social distance yourself. Um, all right, so Emily, you asked Mallory's link for her webinars and YouTube. Um, so I, I could that include that in, uh, let me see. Um, Mallory, if you're still there, feel free to type in uh, uh, the, uh, the handle. It, it's Miss Mallory Adventures. So M S M A L L O R Y Adventures. A D V N T U R E uh, E S. Uh, so Miss Mallory Adventures. Um, what made me become so passionate about animals? Asked Rachel Adams. By the way, Rachel is uh, a good friend of mine and a former coworker of mine at the Houston Zoo where I used to work. And uh, so thanks for the question. I know Rachel is passionate about turtles and all animals as well. What made me become so passionate? I don't know. You know, uh, if you're passionate about something, sometimes you do wonder, why am I passionate? And I, and I think that just is what's so beautiful about being uh, intrinsically linked to something. Whether you're passionate about baseball and you wanna be a major league player someday, 
uh, whether you're passionate a bit about uh, plants and would love to uh, you know, be the curator of an amazing botanical garden, or of course, whether you're passionate about turtles, there's something just innate that makes you passionate about these animals. And I'm really lucky that that innate passion was for turtles. Um, all right, uh, a couple more questions. Um, all right, uh, when, the, when the turtles are complete with, how, how that can affect them and how can we help them? Um, uh, there might be a little bit of a language barrier there, uh, Morena, but uh, I'll try to answer that. Um, so um, there's many, many ways in which turtles are threatened uh, by human activity. And we're gonna get to that in a future webinar. So be on the lookout for a future webinar that talks about the threats to turtles and how you can help and how the Turtle Survival Alliance um, is helping with programs all across the earth. So thanks a lot for that question. Pelf says, gotta go, catch you another day. Thank you for a great class. Pelf, love the work you're doing as always. Great to have you on and uh, good night. James, James Beach asks, how can I get my biology or environmental science students involved in captive breeding programs? I live in New York. Uh, James, really good uh, question. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I have a really broad network that I'm able to, uh, to connect students with. Um, feel free to either reach me um, on Instagram at Jordan Turtleman. Uh, you could reach us on our Instagram at Turtle Survival. Uh, you threw my email, which I'm about to put up in a minute, or it's on this comment thread, uh, jgray at turtlesurvival.org, or, uh, you know, message me on Facebook. So glad to get you involved, James, and uh, can't wait to. All right. Um, Rachel then asks, who was your favorite tortoise at Natural and Counties? Billy, Maria, or Vicky? All right, so <laughs> she's talking about, so we had a Natural Encounters at the Houston Zoo, we had two star tortoises, Indian star tortoises. We had a leopard tortoise, uh, and we had a red-footed tortoise. And uh, definitely the leopard tortoise was my favorite of all of them. Uh, and mostly that's because she slightly had a nice scent of nacho cheese about her from living next to this very peculiar animal called a binturong, also known as a bear cat, who, by the way, emits a, uh, an odor that's very much been uh, likened to nacho cheese, Frito-Lays, um, uh, or other, uh, other things that might... Uh, you know, tempt your uh, olfactory senses with delight. Um, and uh, so that's my favorite tortoise, Rachel. Uh, Diego, uh, thanks a lot. Um, can't wait to get you plugged into local conservation efforts. Diego, please reach out to me because I'd love to plug you in somehow. Um, Carrie says, Miss Summerhill's class at Beach Hill uh, wants to know the difference between a snapping turtle and are they dangerous? Excellent question. So uh, snapping turtles, um, uh, the uh, Chelydridae, um, are in a different group, and they have um, very, very sharp, strong jaws. Um, they also uh, tend to have uh, somewhat of serrations on their shell. But if you really want to distinguish a snapping turtle from other turtles in the United States or nor uh, North America, or Central America, so Canada, the United States, and countries into well into Central America. Uh, what you want to look at is the tail. So, uh, for snapping turtles, whether it be the alligator or the common snapping turtle, also known as the eastern snapping turtle, um, or some of the ones in Central America, uh, the tail is about the same length as the top shell or the carapace. Uh, that tail also typically has uh, some degree of uh, serrations on it or pr uh, pronounced scales. And that's really the easiest way to tell the difference between a snapping turtle from any other species of turtle in uh, North uh, uh, or, or Central America. 
And are they dangerous? Really good question. So personally, I don't regard snapping turtles as a danger to me because I've been around snapping turtles my whole life. I've worked with the alligator snapping turtles in Texas. I've worked with the common or Eastern snapping turtle all over its range. Um, but, are, but are they dangerous? Uh, well, their bite is very powerful. Their jaws are very sharp and they're very, very fast. So uh, to the untrained person, yes, they can be dangerous. Um, if, if one is crossing a road or in your backyard, I don't recommend moving them unless you know what you're doing. Uh, so please find somebody who's experienced. Now, the interesting thing is I've been in the water with tons of snapping turtles and never once have they displayed aggression in the water. And there's a good reason for that. So a snapping turtle really doesn't feel at, at too much at threat when it's in its water, its aqueous environment. Uh, but once they're out of the water, um, they do feel rather threatened if approached by a predator like a human. Remember, they think of humans as a large predator. So um, that is when they can be at their most aggressive. Excellent question. All right, Claire says, shout out to the Hudson Valley. Heck yeah. Um, all right, any other questions? All right, a lot of people are saying thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's about time to go here. So what I wanna leave you with is this. You wanna learn more about turtles? There's tons of turtle books out there. Uh, so read a turtle book. The ones I personally grew up on uh, was the Handbook of Turtles by Archie Carr, um, the Turtles of the United States and Canada by Roger Barber, uh, Carl Ernst, and Jeffrey Lovich, uh, as well as Turtles of the World uh, by uh, uh, Carl Ernst. And then lastly, but not least, is the Encyclopedia of Turtles uh, by our beloved Peter Pritchard, uh, who recently uh, passed away, a great loss to the turtle world. Also, follow the TSA on our social media channels so you can learn more. Uh, go to a nature camp, get involved outdoors, find turtles outdoors, learn about them. That's how I got started. That's how you can get started too. Uh, also, volunteer with a turtle research group or project. I kind of talked about that, but that's a great way to learn the basics of turtles is to get involved with a project because I guarantee you the scientists or the citizen scientists working with those projects will be glad to answer your questions. Um, lastly, send an email to me, jgray at turtlesurvival.org. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions or help get you involved with a turtle project. Or if you'd like me to do a webinar specifically for your group or class, also email me and I'll be happy to do that on behalf of the Turtle Survival Alliance. So stay tuned. Coming up next in Turtles 201, we're going to talk about their diet and feeding more in depth. We're going to talk about males versus females. We're going to talk about their reproduction, including egg, uh, egg laying, uh, incubation, uh, sex determination, all sorts of fun stuff there, uh, and then age and longevity. So that so those are all really uh, great topics that I get questions about all the time, and that's going to be in Turtles 201. Um, how can you get involved? Again, go to our TSA website. We have 10 ways that you can get, uh, uh, that you can help turtles. So go to our website, turtlesurvival.org, uh, type in the 10 ways you can get involved with turtles and check out that blog. Um, it's a great way to share with uh, uh, peers uh, and children alike. Uh, volunteer with the TSA program on our website. website. Go to Get Involved, Volunteer, North American Freshwater Turtle Research Group. It's an awesome opportunity to get uh, involved with a one-of-a-kind citizen science project. We catch lots of turtles. You're going to learn a lot doing that. Um, become a TSA member. This is important because if you want to stay involved with turtles, we have to protect them first. We have to make sure they are still around on Earth. And the TSA 
is at the forefront of protecting our turtles and tortoises all around the world. Um, uh, lastly there, if to get involved, help support a TSA program. Look, times are tough right now. Uh, we fully understand that at the TSA, but times are also tough for turtles. So uh, as, as we uh, hopefully come back from this global pandemic, as hopefully the economy starts to rebound, it's also gonna be a time where we have to start thinking about all those animals that don't have a voice and need uh, their protection to continue during this time and then continue well after this troublesome period for humanity. So supporting a TSA project is a great way to make sure that turtles survive on this earth for another million years. Again, check us out on our social media at Turtle Survival uh, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And lastly, I just wanna say thank you all to tuning in. You all have been amazing. I know there's so much turtle love out there. I know this webinar has been long, uh, but hey, I love all the questions. So thank you for asking those questions. Thank you for making this webinar a, uh, a lengthy period where we can interact with one another while we're not able to personally right now. Um, and again, this will be on our YouTube channel. So please, uh, if you uh, had to leave early or wanna go back and rewatch a part, go to our YouTube channel. Feel free to click at any point in the webinar and I will see you again for Turtles 201. T-U-R-T-L-E power and turtle love. Jordan Gray, signing out.